The Deep Dark Truth Podcast makes no claims as to the guilt or innocence of anyone involved in this or any case, but we do take great care and responsibility in helping families raise awareness and get their voice heard. Throughout the episode, we will make clear what information has been gathered through news sources and documentation. The interview portion contains the opinions of family members or friends based on experiences that can't always be backed by documentation and therefore should be cited as opinion. If you know a case that you believe needs more coverage, please email us at the Deep Dark Truth Podcast at gmail.com. You are in the place where mysteries and the missing meet, where conspiracies lurk around every corner. Welcome to the Deep Dark Truth. Welcome back to the Deep Dark Truth. I'm Mo. I'm Chip. And I'm Mikey. Today, we're going to be discussing the case of Jacob Landine. We'll also be joined by his brother and victim advocate, Eric Carter Landine, who you may know as the host of the True Consequences podcast. So first of all, I just want to thank Eric. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And we'll be talking to Eric periodically throughout the episode. Some notes before we get started. We will not be using the name of the accused perpetrator in this case. The reason for that is that Jacob's family doesn't want their vocality concerning the case to potentially affect action taken against him in the future. And by the time we get to the end of this episode, I think you're going to see why. Not only is this man the main suspect, but according to police documents, at some point he confessed. He was even arrested, but never underwent the trial process in what seems to be some sort of paperwork error. We're not exactly sure what happened, but we do know that he was arrested and released on bond, but then the trial phase was not initiated. Because there's a lot to get to, I'm going to go ahead and start us off. On April 10th, 1987, Jacob Londine was nine months old. He was being babysat by his mother, Brenda's boyfriend, in the hour overlap between his grandmother going to church and his mother coming home from work. So at the time, Brenda's boyfriend was also living in the home, so it made sense for Jacob just to be dropped off early at the home as well. Jacob's grandmother dropped him off around 6 p.m., But just one hour later, Brenda's boyfriend came into her place of work at a local grocery store chain to tell her that her little boy was being taken to the hospital in an ambulance and was not breathing. Initially, at the time, he said that Jacob had fallen off the couch. This would be his first account of what happened, but it would not be the last. To understand the circumstances that led to the death of Jacob, we're going to have to go back to a few months before his tragic death. In 1986, when Jacob was six months old, his mother Brenda and his biological father, Jean, separated. Brenda was in an unhappy and neglectful marriage where her husband would leave for days at a time with two children, struggling to provide and keep up with them. He was also having an emotional affair. And in the meantime, her husband's best friend was convincing her that things would be better if they were just together, despite the fact that he too was married. But not only was he her husband's best friend, he also had several, several ties to Brenda's family. If you're just hearing about this case for the first time, you might be thinking they hadn't been together very long. What would make this woman trust her child to this man? And there are several reasons for that. He was tied to the family in multiple ways and even related in some ways. And so, Eric, can you speak on those ties a little bit and why exactly your mother already trusted this man to be someone that had her children in his care. My hometown, Socorro, was very small, still is very small. I think there may have been 8,000, 9,000 people living there in the 1980s. And so because of that, everybody knows everybody. And if you're not related to somebody, you're probably related to somebody that's related to them. It's just that kind of place. So my mom grew up with this individual. They went to school together. They had known each other their whole lives. My family went to the church that his father was the pastor of. My dad was doing a little bit of a mentorship with his father, and that's how they met. And that's where my dad met my mom in the church. So there's that connection, but then there's even more of a connection because his sister married my mom's brother. They're no longer married, but they they were together at the time. And so there's that connection to the family. His aunt is my godmother. There's just so many layers, and everybody knows, like I said, everybody knows everybody, 
my mom knew him her entire life, so she had no reason to think that he was anything other than what she knew him to be and what his public persona was. He was very connected to people in power. You know, he worked for the county. He had keys to every county building, including the DA's office. He played basketball with the police every single weekend. He was friends with all of them. They all grew up together. For, you know, for everybody who was around him, he was thought to be a really upstanding, friendly, nice person. People really didn't think that he was capable of the things that he later proved to be capable of. The fact is that he could have, under some different circumstances, somehow been led to watch either of you anyway. Well, and he was my dad's best friend. I know for me, if I wanted someone to watch my kid, my best friend would be probably the first person I would think to ask because that's the person I trust the most, right? Absolutely. So Brenda would leave her husband when Jacob was six months old, leaving Texas for New Mexico with both Jacob and his older brother, Eric, wanting to be closer to her family. He too would leave his wife soon after. In those few months leading up to Jacob's death, bruises began to appear and odd circumstances began to emerge. His mother found sunflower seed shells in his crib. Another occasion, Jacob's grandmother picked him up and lifted him and he started screaming instead of giggling. And according to the grandmother, seemed to be terrified and was hard to settle. His reactions were shifting from his previous interactions as a normal toddler. Later in a police interview, it would be noted that Jacob would yell and scream when the boyfriend specifically picked him up. During that same interview, we are led to believe that her boyfriend had only been alone with Jacob a handful of times, but all of these times seemingly resulted in either injury or odd circumstances. When Jacob's mother, Brenda, asked her boyfriend about the circumstances, he always seemed to have an answer. When she pondered his reactions to being picked up, he insisted that Jacob always react in that same manner, and that that was just his normal reaction. When she questioned a bruise, The boyfriend's reply was that he had seen Jacob's brother Eric kick him in the head, insisting that Eric was jealous of Jacob, and that's where some of these issues were stemming from. Approximately a month prior to Jacob's passing, Brenda had to take Jacob to the ER, where they had to drain fluid from his cranium. While at the hospital, she was given no explanation as to what could have caused it when she found this soft spot filled with fluid. And let me clarify for those that will wonder, well, how would the hospital know? While the doctors wouldn't know exactly the circumstances that caused an injury, they would likely know what kind of injury it was. For example, if the injury was caused by an object. But at this time, according to Brenda, no pointed questions were asked of her by hospital officials, but the hospital did then contact Child Protective Services and Health and Human Services were informed. During this inquiry by Health and Human Services, an anonymous tip was placed from a neighbor saying that they suspected that Brenda's boyfriend was hitting baby Jacob. A lot of failures in this case. Failures by mandated reporters, failures by the system, failures to notice things that were happening and tie them all together. Some of that goes back to the fact that this man was so embedded in this community and had so many ties to the people around him that they didn't think that he could have been capable of these things. And some of the errors are a lot harder to explain away. And for me, this is one of those types of errors. When those concerns were brought to the caseworker's attention, the caseworker noted that Brenda's boyfriend seemed concerned. And that, in addition to being told that Eric had allegedly kicked Jacob prior to this, seemed to be enough for the caseworker to tie it in a neat little bow and walk away. The verdict was... He seems like a nice guy, so it must be all good. With the culmination of all these strange circumstances, Brenda persisted to question. He then, in my opinion, coerced a confession from Eric by insisting that Eric be truthful. And you might think, what is wrong with that? Well, reading through the police reports, in the past he had threatened spankings for lying. And by insisting repeatedly that Eric 
was lying and that he wouldn't be punished if he just told the truth. He was backing him into this corner of either being hit or just saying that he did it in front of his mom. It would be later noted during a police interview that Eric gave that Eric insisted that he did not, in fact, kick Jacob prior to the incident that caused his death. Here are some other supporting facts from the documentation that led me to this conclusion. Later, when Jacob's biological father, Gene, is interviewed, he says that he talked to Eric and Eric had said that this boyfriend never hit him, but said that if Eric ever lied, then he would hit him. In another interview, Eric says that the boyfriend never hit, but acted like he was going to, saying he better be quiet or he'll get hit with a belt. But then the police report noted, quote, but he didn't actually threaten you, unquote. It seems that what he means by this is asking Eric, were you outright threatened to make this confession in front of your mother? And I'm not sure if this is a matter of reading the documents through text or whether or not he was really asking a question with a lot of nuance for a five, six-year-old. Because we don't understand at this time how much of the word threatened Eric really comprehends in terms of implied threats and being fearful by things that were threatened before. And Eric, to this day, doesn't remember a lot of this conversation and a lot of these interviews, of course, because of the trauma associated with them in his young age. The officer also notes that Eric became agitated, insisting that a child be quiet or not lie or you're going to be hit with belts. That's a threat. Like, am I crazy? That's a threat. As a result of this confession, Eric was sent to live with his father in California soon after, but Brenda was still not convinced. Eric was only five years old. He had been ecstatic to have a little brother. In fact, he had begged, even going so far as praying for one, telling his mother when she was pregnant that he was sure that she was going to give him a little brother, even though that she believed she was carrying a girl. Eric, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with your little brother, Jacob? Jacob was my miracle sibling. Um, My family was very religious when I was growing up, and so prayer was a normal part of, of our everyday experience. And I used to pray every day for God to give me a baby brother. My mom and and dad were having problems, but my mom ended up getting pregnant with Jacob, and I was super excited, super happy, very much feeling like he was an answer to my prayers and um, just ready to be a big brother. Jacob was kind of the complete opposite of who I was as a child. He was fearless and um, a bit of a daredevil. He liked things that were crazy and scary and dangerous. And and I was very much the opposite of that. I was very timid and um, fearful. <laughs> Everything scared me. And so he brought all of this energy with him into our lives. And it was, you know, he didn't live very long, but he made a huge impact in my life and a huge impact in my mom's life and his joy and his energy was just infectious. His laugh was unlike any other laugh I've ever heard in my life. Um, I'll never forget it. It's, I still haven't heard anybody who laughs like him. Um, it's just kind of burned in my memory. So he, he was a joy to be around and He's definitely missed. There's definitely a big hole in our family um, since he died. Eric may have left for his father's after this, but unfortunately, things continued. And some pieces of the puzzle would be fitted together only with retrospect by Jacob's mother years after the fact. What she once assumed to be the natural overattachment of a baby to one's mother, scared to be left without them specifically, would later leave her with questions of abuse. Which brings us back to Jacob's tragic death on April 9th, 1987. The medical exam revealed a cause of death of blunt force trauma, with injuries on his body being approximately the size of a grown man's hand on his buttocks. 
Many different explanations would be provided to the police spanning years. So to save a lot of confusion, I'm just going to list them here to the best of my ability. There very well may be more that were whispered to members of the family or friends, but these are the ones that are listed in the documentation. The first explanation Brenda's boyfriend gives to medical personnel directly following the incident, and that is that while he was recording mixtapes, he turned his back and Jacob fell off the couch, and he must have hit his head on the coffee table, though he did not see it. The couch at this time was maybe two and a half feet tall, according to family members, and 30 minutes later claimed that yellow fluid was coming out of Jacob's nose. This would later be identified as brain fluid. He also said that Jacob had been sick, fussy, etc. since the initial head injury a month earlier, which to an extent is a claim that is backed in other interviews later between police and other family members. The second is that he was kneeling in front of Jacob. He lifted his head up to catch Jacob, and his head hit Jacob, and then Jacob forcefully hit the floor. He then held Jacob for 10 minutes, set him on the couch, and Jacob fell off the couch, hitting his head a second time. Jacob then vomited and convulsed, and then the boyfriend tried to hit his back to clear the airway, which is kind of the explanation for why there was bruising the size of a man's hand. Then another story, Jacob was leaning on the boyfriend's neck. And while the boyfriend was lying on the floor, he was kind of tossing him and catching him in the air. And Jacob fell to the left, not the right in the way that he had predicted. He then said that his eyes were white and he wasn't moving. And when Jacob wasn't responding, he decided to run to the neighbors. He then claimed that he went blank, in quotations, and probably went to get Brenda, but doesn't remember talking to the police. He then claimed that he lied about the circumstances surrounding Jacob's death on other occasions because he feared that Jacob's grandfather, meaning Brenda's father, would shoot him and claimed that the detective also threatened him. The fourth and final story that we're going to include is even stranger than any of the rest. The boyfriend told police on another occasion that Jacob was standing and he was balancing himself with the wooden armrest of a chair. Of course, Jacob was only nine months old, so he was still using objects to stand up. He then said that he knelt beside Jacob and he angled his chin, quote, in a position to playfully rub his growth of beard between the child's legs, unquote. While doing so, he sensed, it then goes on to say, while doing so, he sensed that Jacob was about to lose his balance. And so he jumped up, raising his head to prevent him from falling. But instead, Jacob had leaned his body over the boyfriend's head. So what happens is this kind of headbutt situation where he raises his head very quickly. He knocks Jacob off his feet and it caused Jacob to impact heavily on the floor. And then he further says that he was, quote, certain the child's head struck the wooden armrest before he fell to the floor, unquote. If you have questions about why a grown man that has only known this child for three months is rubbing his growth of beard in between Jacob's legs, you are not alone. You are absolutely not alone in that. We all do weird things with kids, especially when they're your kids. So you might bite your toddler's toes or say that you're going to eat their fingers or blow bubbles on their stomach. The way that we interact with children is weird, but typically not something like that. And typically not with somebody that's not your own direct child or family member and not a child that you've only been interacting with for a few months. But let's go back to the day that Jacob died. Dr. McWilliams was one of the physicians who attended Jacob when he was in the hospital. In addition to Dr. McWilliams, there was also a doctor named Dr. Eric Marchand, who was the attending neurosurgeon at the time. Dr. McWilliams said that he could feel the skull fracture, which felt like it was fresh in the posterior position of Jacob's head. There was also a healed scar from the previous admission but there was no other obvious trauma. In the police reports, the doctor told the police that when he told Brenda and the boyfriend that Jacob had died, 
the boyfriend seemed nervous that this would, quote, make him look real bad, unquote. This was allegedly said after Brenda left the room, very upset, as you might expect. When the doctor pressed the boyfriend and informed him that he did not feel that these injuries could have been sustained from falling off the couch, the initial reason that he gave, the boyfriend doubled down and said, quote, I did not hit him, unquote, despite the fact of the doctor never outright asking, but rather just informing him this specific way does not sound correct. Dr. Lance was the pathologist who did the autopsy. He stated that he found a broken rib, which was an old injury, in addition to the older head injury. He also found recent trauma to the head. Dr. Lance stated that the skull had been fractured along a suture and an open hand had probably caused the injury. He noted that there were no marks on the scalp and very little blood under the skin. Dr. Lance felt that the onset of symptoms that Jacob would have had would have occurred no more than one half an hour after the fact. He also also noted, of course, trauma to the buttocks of Jacob. The police then interviewed a number of people, including Jacob's grandmother and biological father. During the interview with grandma, she verified that Jacob had been sick for the last two weeks, vomiting, he had an ear infection, basically all of the things that the boyfriend said, and noted that it took four days for Jacob to eat. In the interview with his biological father, Gene, he talked about how Brenda had called him a few weeks ago to take custody of Eric. Thinking that Eric wasn't getting enough attention, he talked to Eric and Eric told him at the time that the stepboyfriend had never hit him, but had threatened that if he ever lied that he would hit him. Mr. Landon also said that Eric was feeling a lot of guilt over Jacob's death and that he loved Jacob and that Jacob had pulled his hair and he didn't know that he had hit Jacob hard. Eric then told his father that he was sorry and he felt bad. He said that he knew what happened, that Eric had accidentally hit Jacob on the head, that they had operated on Jacob, and then Jacob fell off the sofa and died. Eric insisted that if he had never hit Jacob, they wouldn't have had to operate on him and Jacob would not have died. The fact that a child knows this much about the situation just absolutely devastates me, especially because it's insinuated that Eric never kicked Jacob, but maybe he had pushed him or did something when Jacob pulled his hair, a completely different story than the boyfriend had originally given. And then you have Eric being insanely guilty over something that had nothing to do with him. And to have a child be living with this guilt and be thinking that this is a result of their own actions, for that to be allowed to continue is gross. Eric and Jacob's father then tell the police they don't have a lot of firsthand information concerning how the children were treated in the home, but that he had received a call from the boyfriend's previous wife, who told him that he should file a child abuse complaint after an incident when the boyfriend took his biological children to see their mother to drop them off and left Eric and Jacob at home alone. During this incident, Eric had allegedly dropped Jacob while taking him out of the crib, but Mr. Londeen felt that the problem was resolved now that Eric was out of the home. Next, we're going to talk about the missing confession, the polygraph test, and the polygraph results. But first, it's time for an ad break. London Stock Exchange Group is here to be your essential global markets infrastructure and data partner, where open isn't just a platform, but a philosophy, giving you the freedom to make your mark in the world. LSEG, open makes more possible. If this case didn't already have enough twists and turns with the amount of versions of events that crop up and how many different times the story changes, it's further complicated by a missing confession. So the supplemental report provided via FOIA says... Quote, on April 14th, 1987, at approximately 4 p.m., Agent DeWalt was contacted by telephone by Detective Apodaca. Detective Apodaca advised Agent DeWalt that the polygraph examination wouldn't be necessary as a confession had been obtained 
However, we cannot find any written documentation of this confession and what exactly this confession said. Furthermore, six days later, on April 20th, Agent DeWalt spoke to the Assistant Chief Johnny Trujillo of the City Police Department in Socorro, New Mexico. Assistant Chief Trujillo told Agent DeWalt that he had interviewed the boyfriend on the 14th, six days prior, at approximately 10.30 a.m., and during that interview, he had obtained a confession from the boyfriend. In Agent DeWalt's report, there's not a mention of what exactly he had confessed to and under what circumstances he confessed to them. We don't know exactly what happens to change those circumstances in between April and July 9th. On July 9th, 1987, Brenda's boyfriend was given a polygraph test. According to documentation, in relation to the relevant questions number 33 and 35 that concerned whether or not he had, quote, intentionally struck Jacob, he said no, but the polygraph indicated that he was being deceptive. Many excuses would be made later in regards to why these questions were deceptive or why he didn't pass the polygraph. Here are the greatest hits. That he was sedated before the polygraph. That he was, quote, messed up during the polygraph because he was grieving and freaked out. He was also, quote, freaked out after the divorce and at some point thought that he was a kid back in the hospital. That... He took allergy meds and doesn't remember being asked any of the questions. And that he actually did not fail at all because he alleged that the polygrapher said that the machine was broken and that the current DA had also said the machine was broken. To clarify, the DA at the time was Brenda's divorce lawyer later. Again, this is a small town. So basically he's saying that he found out through the DA going through the divorce process, that actually the polygraph machine was broken. During this period of time, Brenda never suspected anything other than a tragic accident that resulted in the loss of her little boy. She wasn't made aware of all of the information that the police knew about her boyfriend's statements, or that the doctor at the hospital found him suspicious, or that his polygraph test had indicated that he was being deceptive at all. In fact, In the police documentation, part of the reason that they didn't file charges right away, despite the doctor, despite previous incidents, despite all of these different suspicious things that were happening, was because they considered Brenda to be providing an alibi for him. Brenda, who was at the supermarket working. Quote, investigator Gordon also stated that Brenda Crawford had initially provided him with an alibi, that the incident was an accident, as to how the injury Jacob received, that which resulted in his death, unquote. How can Brenda possibly be providing an alibi when she wasn't there and had told investigators that she wasn't there? The question that was posed to Brenda was, do you think that he was capable of this? To which Brenda said, she didn't think so. That's it. That's the alibi? So unknowing of all the facts that the police had, that there was any indications at all that this was an abusive situation and anything other than an accident, shortly after Jacob's death, Brenda married her boyfriend. They did separate a couple of years later in 1990 after the marriage allegedly became abusive and toxic. And through those abusive and toxic experiences that Brenda was going through, she started to question who this person was that she married. And as his stories kept shifting, she became very suspicious. That led her to go back to the police department. That led her to go back to the police department after their separation. From the State of New Mexico Incident Report, quote, Brenda Crawford made contact with investigator Gordon and changed her mind and her story. She now wanted criminal charges filed against her boyfriend and former husband for beating her son to death, unquote. I just want to take a second to say that I am reading both the supplemental documentation, documentation that was after this case was investigated later, and the initial reports as well. And at no point does Brenda 
alibi him. In fact, she doesn't even say that he's completely incapable of it. She says that she doesn't think so, that she doesn't think that he would hurt her child. And they have only been together for three months at this time. Brenda is not aware of any of the information from the doctors, from the police about the polygraph. And to put on a woman that perhaps she's just changing her story of of thinking that this man is responsible for her son's death after being abused by him and knowing things that she didn't know years prior. The implication of that, this investigator should be absolutely ashamed of himself considering the amount of supporting facts that this woman was not aware of. The only time the abuse that Brenda experienced within the marriage is documented is when she goes to the police when she's finally separate from her husband. From the supplemental report, quote, Brenda stated that they were married for three years. She advised that during that time, she was verbally and physically abused by him during the marriage. Brenda also stated that her older son, Eric, was verbally abused, but that he had never hit Eric, unquote. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, not only because it's it's important to bring these stories to light and get them out in the open and talk about them, but also because of the fundamental shift that these situations caused in Brenda realizing that maybe perhaps something was wrong and started pushing the police to look deeper. Although at this time, the police already had a lot of information that they weren't telling her. But these are the incidents that helped Brenda come to the terms with the fact that perhaps everything wasn't what it appeared to be. Because there's limited documentation about this, which we will discuss in a moment why that is, I'd like to pose the question to Eric of what was living in the house with your mother and her husband during this period of time like? It was a nightmare. It was the worst time of my life. It was constantly being afraid that I was going to be killed or my mom was going to be killed. Um, he, he switched his personality changed dramatically as soon as they were married to the point that we would be sitting on the couch, for example, watching television and he would say something and I would look up at him to acknowledge that he was speaking. And he would accuse me of giving him dirty looks. And my mom would often come to my defense saying something like, he wasn't giving you dirty looks, you just said something and he looked up to acknowledge you. And immediately he would grab her by the hair and drag her into the room and just start beating the shit out of her. Um, he would often hit her in front of me. He would slap her, punch her, kick her, um, put her in a chokehold. You know, drag her by her hair while punching her in the face. These were just the things that happened on a regular basis in in the house. And as time progressed and, and went on, it got worse. You know, I was continuously locked in my bedroom for hours and hours at a time. If I needed the restroom, I would have to knock on my door and hope that he heard me. Usually he had the music on so loud that he would not be able to hear me. Um, but if he did hear me and he did come to the door, he would ask me what I wanted. I would say I need to use the restroom. And if he felt like he didn't want to let me out or if he didn't feel like I actually needed the restroom, I wasn't allowed to leave the room. And, and more times than not, I wasn't allowed to leave. So I had to figure out ways to relieve myself in my bedroom, um, which I'm not necessarily proud of but it was just something that I had to do and so because of that constant state of fear and terror and uncertainty I started to prepare to defend myself if I needed to um, and the way that I did that was I kept a, a can of aerosol hairspray uh, and a lighter and a kitchen knife under my pillow and I had a baseball bat under my bed and I think I was probably like seven or eight years old when I started to 
take those things and hide them so that I could protect, protect myself if, if I ever needed to. Um, just because it was so, it was constant. The abuse was constant and it never stopped. So I never knew what was going to set him off. It was always something and it was always either my fault or my mom's fault, according to him. And so I was really like I had all these plans in my head of how I was going to defend myself and, and get out of there if I had to. Um, it, it was it was terrifying living like that all the time. He, he locked me in a clothes dryer one time for the entire day because I had used what he said was the wrong knife to make a sandwich. Um, I used a big kitchen knife instead of a smaller knife, and so that angered him enough to lock me in the clothes dryer for the entire day. Um, and then, you know, eventually it, it progressed. He he sexually abused me. Um, he, he was just... He was just a monster. He was evil. That's so horrifying. And I am so sorry that I have to even ask you and have you relive that as part of this and that you have to re-traumatize yourself to try and get justice for Jacob to have people understand like this is someone that was close to the family that was a nice guy until he wasn't anymore and the reason that we can believe that he is capable of these things in addition to the documentation is how he showed his true colors after. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for that. But, you know, it's, it is important to the story to illustrate what he was like when people weren't watching him. When he, when he knew he had somebody under his control and power and he could do whatever he wanted. And it, it's important to know that because, uh, it also makes it very clear to understand why my mom initially didn't think he was capable of what what we now think he's capable of and then why after he proved to us that he was capable of it why we felt like he was you know pretty clearly in our minds responsible for Jacob's death um just because he had proven that he was lethal you know there was a, a time when my mom and him were fighting and, and her screams were so blood curdling. I knew something was different. Something was wrong. And I had been locked in my room with his kids. And so I, when my mom stopped screaming, broke out of my room through breaking the window and ran around to the other side of the house and started throwing rocks through their window in their bedroom. And I, I later found out that he had wrapped a wire hanger around my mom's neck and was strangling her and that she had lost consciousness. And had I not done what I did, she believed that she, that he would have killed her uh, because he was, he was determined to do it at that point. And he kept saying things to her like, the only way you're leaving me is in a body bag. He would say that all the time. Which brings us back to at certain times after one of these domestic violence incidents, the police would become involved. And then what would happen? What were those interactions like? Nothing. Nothing would happen. Um, he would talk to them and they would laugh and joke and, and you know, they would leave. They would never go any further than that. And of course, you know, they would ask my mom if she wanted to press charges and she would say no because she was terrified that if she did, he would kill her. So she inevitably would say no and then they would just leave. And there was never a report filed. There were never, there was never anything done to him, even though oftentimes it was the neighbors calling the police. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't always us. And in fact, it was less us and more people around us because they could hear what was happening. And he would walk into our house. I mean, the police, all they had to do was step inside the door to see all the holes in the wall, to see where he had punched through the walls all through the entire house. I mean, it was, it was obvious what was happening, but they just, they were his friends. And so it was easy for them to, 
you know, say, oh, yeah, so this poor guy and his crazy wife, they're just fighting like, you know, and in the 80s, I think that's kind of was the mentality was people fight and sometimes it gets out of control and it's okay. That old, not my marriage, not my business type of mindset. Exactly. So at what point did you or your mother become aware of the fact that he was ever considered a suspect? I think we knew we knew that people were looking, the police were looking at him. I mean, they were looking at all of us. They were looking at me. They were looking at my mom. They were looking at my grandmother. They were interviewing everybody. And so we always kind of knew that. But the thing is, he, he kept telling us, it it was an accident that Jacob had fallen off the couch was the story that he he gave us. We didn't know that he gave, gave multiple stories to the police. We didn't know that he had confessed. We didn't know any of that information until uh, we received the file back from the state police when they reopened the case. And so I suspected that he had done something to Jacob when my grandfather reacted to him coming to his house one day by running outside and saying, why don't you hit somebody who can talk, you son of a bitch? That That's when I said, oh, maybe this guy actually did something to Jacob. And then it solidified in my mind as we lived with him and went through the hell that we went through. And I think my mom at some point started to realize that he, he might have been responsible. And I, I think she suspected afterwards but you know prior to that we were kind of naive and believed the best in him you mentioned until you received that case file what year did you receive that 2020 do you remember at the beginning when i said brenda's boyfriend had been arrested but that nothing ever came of it let's talk a little bit about that because the circumstances around it are unclear and honestly unbelievable. After the separation, when Brenda went to the police, that started a chain of events where the police look back at all of the information that they had. And on August 12th, 1992, an arrest warrant for abandonment or abuse of a child was issued and signed for the arrest of the boyfriend. The warrant was signed by Judge Smith. Then it was prepared by Detective Lieutenant Joel Haley. It was approved by the district attorney at the time, Lee Deschamps, and then filed. The boyfriend was then arrested a few weeks later on the 25th of August, 1992, by Detective Lieutenant Joel Haley. After that, the criminal complaint was filed with the magistrate court, where the DA at the time, Lee Deschamps, approved that filing. All in all, there were many ways to track this specific case and this specific arrest. Docket numbers, case file numbers, arrest warrant numbers, all provided in order to track people through the system. The boyfriend was read his Miranda rights, he waived his rights verbally and in writing, and then there was a tape-recorded interview with the boyfriend. This is when he gives the story that what happened was Jacob was lying on the floor and he felt that Jacob was losing his balance. Jacob fell to the left when he thought that he was going to fall to the right. It's also when he told police that he feared for his life via Brenda's father and also accused Detective Apodaca of threatening him as well. He also acknowledges that he maintained the first story with Brenda all throughout their marriage because he didn't want to tell Brenda, fearing that Brenda wouldn't marry him. He's also asked in this interview if he had been drinking at all that day, and he told the police that it was possible that he didn't remember specifically, but that it was usual for him to have at least two shots per day. But then, despite this arrest, nothing seems to happen afterwards. And in 2005, the case is re-looked into by another investigator after prodding from the family and outside sources. The investigator goes on a fact-finding mission to try and figure out exactly what happened and why this man that was arrested was never formally brought to justice. Here's a quote from his reporting. 
In May of 2005, I checked with the magistrate court in Socorro, New Mexico. In regards to this investigation, I was attempting to obtain information on the original warrant for arrest, the affidavit for arrest warrant, which was stamped and filed with the magistrate court on August 12, 1992, and the criminal complaint for the abandonment or abuse of a child. These documents had been filed against the boyfriend. I was advised by a magistrate court employee that the magistrate court, in accordance with state law, is only required to maintain their records for five years. And being that the documents in question would have been filed in 1992, those records would have been disposed of sometime before or after August of 1997. I then checked with the district court's office in Socorro County, New Mexico, in regards to this investigation, attempting to see if the above stated documents had been transferred to the district court from the magistrate court and then filed in the district court, as the district court is the court of permanent record. And if, for some reason, the abandonment or abuse of a child, a felony charge, which was apparently initiated in the magistrate court, was somehow bound over to district court for trial. The district court clerk located no criminal court records filed against this man. He then persists to check with investigators, attorneys, the district attorney's office, all of which advise him that they no longer maintained any records in connection with this case. He even goes back to question original investigators with the case. Quote, I asked Chief Haley if he recalled what occurred with this investigation after he was arrested and criminally charged in connection with the death of Jacob Londine. Chief Haley told me he could not recall at this time what happened with the criminal charge that had been filed against him. This is the conclusion of that 2005 look into the case. Investigative conclusion. After an extensive review of the completed investigative reports, which included autopsy reports, it's my opinion that the criminal charge of abandonment or abuse of a child, which resulted in the death of Jacob Londine, was justified and should have been pursued against this man. He was arrested in 1992 and charged with that offense, but after his arrest, it appears that nothing else occurred after the initial filing of the criminal charge, and I have been unable to determine why this occurred, as the records no longer exist. There was sufficient evidence in this investigator's opinion to prove that he knew of Jacob's recent head injury, which occurred several weeks before this incident, and the incident which then resulted in Jacob's death. Unquote. Later in the document, he goes on to say, quote, He did negligently and without justifiable cause place Jacob in a situation that endangered his life. He knew of Jacob's prior injury and combined with the fact that he changed his story or version of events during the investigation, which were witnesses by someone else several times. That fact alone draws a lot of suspicion to any story he tells after his initial statement. The incident which resulted in Jacob's death occurred one way, not two or three ways as told by... He then further goes on to talk about issues with this case being that they did not finish pursuing those criminal charges, such as having an issue of a speedy trial, being the fact that he was arrested in 1992 and the charge wasn't pursued by the state. So we don't know what happened, why these charges weren't pursued if there was an error transferring from one district to another, if some paperwork was conveniently left out. We just don't know. And all we can do is speculate the many things that could have went wrong in this case. But we do know one thing. Jacob Londine deserved justice and him and his family received none. We'll be back to speak more about getting justice for Jacob with his brother, Eric Carter Landine, after this ad break. Eric, when you got the case file in 2020, you then started learning all of these things that you never knew about the case. You have all of this documentation, photos, police reports, the initial interviews, and then the subsequent interviews years later. What was that like for your family to then see this entire situation that was happening behind the scenes that you never knew about? The thing that struck me the most about going through this is that your mom didn't know any of this. So your mom married this man and allowed him to live in a home with her child. 
never knowing that he was likely responsible for the death of her baby. And I think that if she would have known all of those things, it would have fundamentally changed the actions that she took. And all of that resulting domestic violence that happened during the marriage never would have ever had a chance to take place. And none of those situations that you were put in ever would have happened. Yeah, it... um it was frustrating, I'm not going to lie, to read the case file. Because, you know, I think part of what my mom went through after Jacob died was the rationalization of if he did this on purpose, if he actually did this, he would be in jail. Because that's what you would reasonably expect to happen if somebody kills a baby. You would expect them to go to jail. You would expect them to be charged and prosecuted. And so we spent so many years, so many decades, really speculating about what had happened and trying to figure out why he was never charged. And you start to question your own sanity in that situation. It's it's really hard to explain that to somebody that hasn't been through it. But you're you're sitting here, you're looking at all of this that happened. Your your life is in shambles. And you go to the DA and you say, hey, can you look at this again? And they say, no, because you're being vindictive against your poor husband, because you changed your story, because when we asked you last time, you said that you didn't think he was capable of it, but now you do. So we don't believe you anymore. You start to question your sanity. Am I making this worse than it actually is? Am I the one that's wrong here? Why am I the only one that feels like something should happen here why is nobody reacting the way that I feel like they should be reacting? A nine-month-old baby was killed. How come I'm the only one that's concerned about that? And then you start saying, well, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe maybe all of this is, like, in my head. Not even if he was guilty, then he would be arrested. But if they even had a slight suspicion, then the police wouldn't allow me to live in a home with this man who may be responsible for the death of my baby and endanger my other child. I don't think any mother would think that that situation would be allowed to take place if there was even the thought of it. If even he's under suspicion and they can't prove it, anyone I think would, would, tell themselves, well, the police would let me know if I was in danger, if my son was in danger. And that, to me, is just another grotesque miscarriage of justice that happens during this case that someone would be allowed to be ignorant, living with someone that's a suspect in their baby's death. Yeah, and and so what was alarming and frustrating was learning that he had confessed, uh, was learning that he had failed the polygraph, learning that his story had changed multiple times, all of those things. So what I gathered and what I've kind of surmised from reading everything is because my mom said, I don't think so, when they asked her if he if they thought if she thought he was capable of doing that to Jacob because she said, I don't think so. That was why the DA chose not to prosecute like that for me angered me so much because you have all this evidence like that doesn't make any sense. You know, they accused her of giving him an alibi. Well, nobody could have given him an alibi. Nobody was with him other than Jacob. So there is no possibility that anybody could have alibied him in that situation. The only people who know what happened are him and Jacob because they were the only ones there. And so learning all of this really, really, really bothered me. And it makes me start to question, you know, was this on purpose that they didn't prosecute him or was it negligence? Either way, it's wrong. Yeah, because he is arrested and he is arrested and then released on bond. And my question is, normally when you are arrested, when you are released on bond, you are given a court date and the bail bondsman is there to make sure that you show up for court. 
And so my question is, why isn't he given that court date? Why doesn't that court date exist before he leaves, before he leaves jail? I just have so many questions about how was this allowed to happen? How did this possibly slip through this many cracks? There's a reason why there is a chain of events that need to happen when someone is arrested for a crime like this, especially a felony. Well, if we want to ask questions, let's ask why there's no documentation of the confession, why there's no recording of the confession, why there's no transcript of the confession. There's so many questions that I have that I haven't been able to figure out the answer to yet, and I want to know. I want to know why. So how did your personal experience and your experience being Jacob's big brother contribute to you becoming an advocate for other victims and then using your platform to uplift the disenfranchised in New Mexico for other families that were also looking for justice? It's a really good question. Um, you know, I I didn't want to tell Jacob's story initially because it is very painful. Um, anytime I had ever told anybody close to me what had happened to me and to my brother and my mom, in- inevitably they would give me the deer in the headlights look and then promptly get the hell away from me as fast as possible because it was just too much for people to hear. So I stopped, I stopped talking about it. And, but I did pay attention to what was happening in my community and I noticed more and more kids were were dying at the hands of people that should have been taking care of them. And I became very frustrated watching this happen, um, case after case. And I kept saying to myself, you know, somebody should do something, somebody should say something, this has to stop. But really not very many people did anything or said anything. And so as I got into listening to podcasts and learning about different cases, I realized that maybe that was something that I could do. Um, And I had an aha moment that I could create a platform to provide families with a voice. Families that maybe won't, be heard by traditional media because there's nothing new in the case or because it's old news. Um, and, and I wanted to provide a, a platform that would give them an authentic voice. You know, I do very minimal editing on my family interviews and I do that on purpose because I want them to be able to tell their story in their way without having to worry about me creating context that isn't there to tell a story that may not be the real story. And so through that process, I I had a couple of moments where I realized that I was asking people to relive their worst day of their life for me and for my listeners. You know, of course it was, it was for them too to get the story out, but but I was expecting them to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself. And I, and I said something to one of my uh, family members that I was in interviewing. I said that if you are silent about this, then you're permitting it to happen. And I kind of punched myself in the gut with that, realizing that I, I was being silent. I was not talking about the abuse that happened to myself and Jacob and my mom. And so I decided I was going to do it. I was going to talk about it. You know, I, I'm super grateful to have this platform to be able to share it with it, with others that are in the situation because New Mexico has a lot of problems with our justice system. And I know there are problems everywhere, um, but I wanted to tackle my backyard. I wanted to bring those out into the open because it's just, to me, it's really important. I don't want people to have to deal with what my family has had to deal with for the past 34 years. I don't want people to have to worry that whoever's victimizing them is just going to be free to live their life and victimize other people. It's it's a horrible situation. It's a horrible feeling. And so um, that's kind of 
the backstory of how I became an advocate and, and why I'm fighting so hard. So with all of that said, obviously, you and your family have a lot of questions still moving forward. Some of those questions can only be answered by him. And some of those questions, like, where did the confession go? How come he was released without a court date? How come these charges weren't pursued more stringently? Going forward, what does getting justice for Jacob look like? What does the path to that look like? Here's the, here's the thing. We never had our day in court. And I've accepted the fact that we may never get what I think justice for Jacob would be, which would be for this person to be put in jail. Um, and even even if that happens, the chance of him getting the kind of sentencing that I feel would be just is probably pretty slim. So I, I want a day in court. I want I want Jacob's day in court because he deserves that, because he was denied that. I want him to face consequences for what he did. I'm probably not ever going to be happy with whatever the outcome is, but I want something to happen. Something needs to happen because he he took so much from me and from my mom and from our family. And for him to be able to live his life as if nothing's happened is the worst feeling in the world. And so I want him to pay for what he did. I want him to take responsibility for what he did. And I want him to not be able to hurt anybody else ever again. He's had 34 years to continue to do this to other people. And that scares the daylights out of me. Thinking about what kind of damage he could have caused in that amount of time. So I want him off the street. And I want people to be safe from him. You know, it may never happen. Um, but I'm not going to stop fighting. And even if I have to change laws in the state and advocate for that to happen, I will. Um, I don't want anybody else to ever have to go through what my family went through. I don't want that to ever happen to anybody else ever again here. And I know that currently you don't have that justice in sight and that, that arm's length reach. Like if I could just get there, but you're, helping to do it for other families and I know that this isn't the kind of of job where you feel that like you want to be congratulated for helping people because that's that's not why people get into news or into podcasts or become journalists but you are making a positive impact on families that are just like yours I hope so I do I hope it's helping somebody um, because it's not easy to do this. It's not easy to talk about this over and over again. It's, it's really hard and painful. So I hope it's helping somebody. Thank you so much for talking with us about this, for answering so many questions and so much correspondence as we were just going through all of the documents. I know that this is not easy for you, and I just really appreciate it. I know it's one of those situations where, you know, you want people to learn about Jacob, and you you want to make those steps to where you could possibly see a future where this man can no longer hurt someone. But I know that getting there is very re-traumatizing and not something that you want to do if you can help it. Yeah. What do you want to leave people with? What is your call to action? So the call to action I think that that I, I want right now is is I need help just sharing Jacob's story. His, his case is not famous. His, he's not known. You know, there's very little news coverage. There's actually zero other than the coverage that I've generated through harassing people to cover his story. At the time, it didn't even make the local news that he had been killed. And so I, I need that momentum. I need people to help me share his story so that it will be unpopular for the elected official to not take action. Um, as long as people don't know about Jacob's story, they can 
virtually sweep it under the rug and act like nothing happened and get away with it. And that's what they've done for the last 34 years. And so the more people know about it, the less popular it will be for them to do that. And that pressure is what I need to do to create for them so that they can make the right decision, which is to reopen this case and prosecute him for killing my brother. And thank you for lending me your platform to share Jacob's story. There is not even a question. Even aside from before me knowing Jacob's story, I knew you peripherally um, through other mutual friends of ours. Mm-hmm. And I just instantly liked you. I just instantly <laughs> was like, he's our kind of people, like <laughs> me and Mikey and Chip. Like this is someone that I think we would all get along really well with. And when the idea originally, when I thought, oh, maybe one day he could come on the show, I then started listening to your show, learned about Jacob, and was like, okay, it's not going to be the fun episode (laughs) about, like, ghosts or aliens or something silly that I would have initially wanted it to be, which we could always do in the future. But Mm -hmm. I know Eric, and I know enough about Eric to know that he is fighting hard for his little brother. And I want to help him and be a part of that and help Jacob and help be a part of that. So thank you so much. Thank you. We just want to, again, thank Eric for joining us. Please check out his show, True Consequences. We're going to leave all of his social media information as well in the show notes. Also, our friend Jules over at Riddle Me That also is covering this case, and she might have asked some questions that we didn't or vice versa. So we're also going to leave a link in the show notes to her coverage as well. Now it comes to our call to action. We get very invested in our cases, but I think this case is maybe the most invested I've ever been from the moment that I opened the documentation and there were autopsy pictures of Jacob. The amount of sadness I feel over this case and over this family is indescribable. And so our call to action is make him famous. Eric talks about the fact that Jacob's case isn't famous. It didn't get a lot of coverage. And therefore, it is very hard for the family to put any sort of pressure on public officials. And so our call to action is to make him famous. Hashtag justice for Jacob. Share this episode. Eric also covered this case on his own show. Share that episode. Share Jules with Riddle Me That's episode about this. Tell people and spread the word because this shouldn't be allowed to happen. Felony criminal child abuse cases shouldn't be allowed to just disappear, especially considering how much effort it takes for there to ever be an arrest to begin with. If you're wondering where Mikey and Chip are, this was a very hard episode with a lot of different information. So while we've all went over this case together and talked to Eric together and researched together, it was a lot easier to just record with one person. And so we are bringing back After Dark After Dark, of course, is where we just openly discuss cases after everyone has all of the information. It's also a lot more uncensored in terms of language, so expect that episode out soon. Please stay tuned for a promo from Riddle Me That concerning their coverage of Jacob Jeremiah Londine. Until next time, I'm Mo, and there's no snappy one-liners from Chip. Hi, I'm Jules from Riddle Me That True Crime. I'm Robin Warder from The Trail Went Cold, and Jules and I want to tell you a little bit about a case that means a great deal to us, the death of nine-month-old baby Jacob Landine on April the 10th, 1987, in Socorro, New Mexico. The day prior to his death, on April 9th, baby Jacob was being watched by his mother Brenda's new boyfriend, John, not his real name, in his mobile home on 1453 Fatima Drive. While John was babysitting Jacob, Jacob would incur what would be his second head injury in a period of weeks. The prior head injury was a subdural hematoma, or brain bleed, and it was serious enough that it needed to be lanced to take pressure off baby Jacob's brain while being monitored by doctors over the course of several days. The circumstances surrounding how Jacob was injured and subsequently died are murky at best, with the suspect giving multiple versions of the events of the day, ranging from Jacob choking and accidentally hitting his head while trying to dislodge a cookie, 
to Jacob falling and John returning to see the injured infant. The suspect also reportedly confessed to two officers that he was indeed responsible, but there is no paper or audio record of this confession in the police file. The reasons given by the DA for not pursuing the case are confusing as well, with one of the reasons being that they were worried that John would file charges against the state. It was the opinion of the doctors that baby Jacob was struck in the head and this was no accident. In the years to follow, John goes on to sexually abuse young Eric, as well as physically abusing his mother Brenda, and emotionally abusing and isolating them both, making the world very small. During the autopsy, layers of abuse seem to be present. A healing rib fracture from around the time of the first head injury is also discovered. It's impossible to say exactly when the injury took place, but what is clear is that someone was abusing young Jacob, and that person was most likely John. Eric Landine, Jacob's brother, has been fighting to get justice for him. However, he faces some obstacles such as the statute of limitations of six years on second-degree murder that State Representative Bill Ream has petitioned to have overturned. Join Robin and I, as well as criminologist Dr. Ashley Wellman, an investigative expert, a legal expert, a forensic psychiatrist, as well as Jacob's brother Eric, as we explore all angles of this case and try to bring awareness, understanding, and hopefully, ultimately, justice for Jacob. The series starts on March the 1st. Tune in on your favorite podcast app. You just listened to the Deep Dark Truth Podcast. See you next time. And remember, your local cryptids want to meet you. To show you how easy it is to file a claim with GEICO, we hired sports commentator Dick Vitale. Tonight's matchup is me versus an ugly fender bender. If I can eat out a win, it would be a miracle, baby. Um, Mr. Vitale, it wouldn't be a miracle because Geico gives you a team of experts to help manage your claim. That's going to be a nail biter. Nope. The Geico team is there for you 24 7. Now that's a dipsy dude, the guru of a claims team. Geico is awesome, baby, with a capital A. Geico, great service without all the drama.